Hello and welcome to this special program. I am sitting down with someone who is one of the was regarded as one of the world's foremost equity strategists. Uh, I'm sitting down with Christopher Wood at uh, Jefferies, and uh, what a day to sit down with him from the sidelines of the Jefferies Investor Conference here in Gurgaon. Uh, Chris, great to have you with us here. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, I said, what a day to sit down with you because we are sort of coming out of this 50 basis point rate cut uh, from last night. What do you make of it? I know you were expecting 25, but here we've got 50. No, I'm genuinely surprised by the uh, size of the rate cut because it's contrary to the messaging <coughs> of the Fed going into the meeting, which is that the economy is okay and uh, the employment market is weakening, but only gradually. So, yeah, if I had talk to me yesterday, I would have said 25 basis points. I think there was an article in the Wall Street Journal uh, suggesting it might be 50 the, the weekend, so that was probably the clue that they were going to go bigger. But bottom line is contrary to the messaging going in. But the key point here is what the Federal Reserve believes is the neutral rate. Mm -hmm. So my guess that is probably in the 3 to 3.5% three range. So even if the U.S. achieves the, um, the, the soft landing, so to speak, uh, we're probably going to be at between 3 three and a half by the middle of next year. But in terms of the short term, I'm surprised it's... it's uh, yeah, I'm surprised it's 50 basis points. Hmm. Do you think it's, it's got a political angle to it as well, with elections in November? My guess, given, given the fact that whatever they might argue today, is, is quite anybody who can read and listen is contrary to the messaging going into the meeting. So my guess at the margin is political. Hmm. Because it's pretty clear that most, probably the vast majority of Fed members of the Fed would prefer uh, Donald Trump not being, re not being elected. I see. Uh, and, does it and I'm sure the Republican candidate will view it as political. <laughs> but does it help at the margin? Maybe. I, I'm not sure it does help. Maybe okay. at the margin. Okay. I want to come back to the U.S. political sort of elections uh, season in just a bit. But uh, we don't see 50 basis point cuts without a crisis. Mm. Either very apparent or, mm. I mean, something which well, they're will, worried about. But there could be conspiracy theories that they know something um, and the economy is much weaker than the which is a risk of them cutting 50 basis points yesterday, actually. But my guess is they actually genuinely believe the economy is OK. So that's why I think the motivating factor is political. And there clearly are some members of the Fed who are very political. Their uh, former New York chairman, Bill Dudley, has been calling aggressively for a 50 basis point rate cut. If I remember correctly, he was the guy who once wrote an article um, calling on the Fed to, to manage monetary policy in a way that could stop President Trump being re-elected in the mm. previous election. So I think there have been quite a lot of people calling aggressively for rate cuts, saying the Fed's behind the curve. But that's not the message transmitted by the Fed chairman, Mr. Powell. Yeah. Mm. Uh, do you believe the economy is solid? I believe the economy is okay. Obviously, the economy is okay right now, but I still believe there is a risk of a U.S. downturn because of the big lags in monetary tightening in this cycle. So if you look at a chart in my presentation I gave this week, there's a chart of M2 nominal GDP growth, which had a huge explosion back in 2020 uh, when, they, when they printed all that money in the pandemic. And actually, while the M2 growth has slowed sharply in the intervening period, while the Fed has been tightening, if you draw a trend line from 1997, the M2 to nominal GDP ratio has only just begun, just gone below the trend line, mm. which is a long-winded way of saying that in liquidity terms, the monetary tightening is only just beginning to bite. Mm. Um, and, you know, the, uh, the labor market is weakening. Mm. All we need for the Fed to be cutting 50 basis points every meeting is one unambiguously bad labor market. Labor market data. Yeah. And you get another 50. Yeah, uh, but then the, then the market will be discounting 50 basis points every meeting. Okay. The Fed themselves in the dot plot is saying that there will they'll be two more 25 right, mm. this year, mm. in 2024. Mm. Yeah, at this point, that seems likely. I think it'll be more than that. Yeah, but I don't really pay any attention to the dot plots. What, what's important is the data. Okay. I and mean, the dot plots are important in terms of the, what the Fed think, but I wouldn't, trade, I wouldn't uh, invest any money on the dot plots. Okay. Uh, so let's assume that... It's a normal kind of an economy, mm. maybe a little slow, uh, slowing at the margin, but no mm. crisis, mm. nothing uh, panicky. And you have these rate cuts which have started. Let's mm. just assume it's 50 now and then mm. maybe another 50 mm. uh, through the end of the year. What does it mean for uh, asset classes like equities? Well, for, for, it's good news for, it should be good news for emerging market equities mm. because in most emerging markets, 
<coughs> particularly here in Asia, central banks all year had the ability, could have cut rates for their own domestic reasons based on the level of real rates and inflation. Mm -hmm. But in the vast majority of the cases, they chose not to cut rates because they were worried that they might undermine their own currencies. Mm -hmm. And in the specific case of Indonesia, which has a currency, the central bank has a currency stability mandate, they actually raise rates despite mm. very high real rates. Mm. So basically, all these central banks will now have room to cut rates, and hopefully their currencies don't get hit. So far, basically, the dollar has been in an increasingly clear weakening trend. Yeah, mm. so that's basically good news for emerging markets. Mm. Uh, so EMs more than US? Uh, in my view, in, yes. in an easing cycle? Yeah, in my view, yes, because in an easing because in the Pacific case of the U.S., the interesting point is how resilient the U.S. Corp listed companies have been to the Fed tightening cycle. And that is explained by this extraordinary uh, statistic that the net interest payments of the U.S. non-financial corporate sector have mm. declined sharply in this Fed tightening cycle, yeah. which is counterintuitive, but it's the reality. And that's because the big tech companies have been earning 5.5% on their cash, but they mm. used to earn zero. Mm. And it's because the investment grade corporate sector in America did a very good job locking in bond deals when they were low, refinancing sure. their debt. So if the higher rates actually were positive for them on the up, it's Quite not. Sure. Yeah. I mean, Where the lower rates will help is the SMEs, because mm. they don't have issue bonds. Mm. And that's the big surprise. SMEs in America have been paying between 9 and 10% to borrow money for the last year. And that's why I'm genuinely surprised how resilient the labor market has been. Has been. Yeah, because they employ most Americans. Yeah. Uh, what about India, uh, Chris? I mean, well, in the case of India, the RBI can cut rates like... Uh, Later this year. Like, well, I mean, all Asian central banks can cut rates today, mm. including the RBI. Mm. But my colleagues here, we believe the RBI is not, you know, not going to be aggressively cutting. Mm. I.e., the RBI is going to behave in a different way from the Fed. Mm. Okay. And actually, the RBI in recent months has been actually counter-cyclical mm. because they've been doing these preemptive uh, regulatory measures as mm. regards the banking system. Mm. And so, I would assume the RBI will cut rates once before the end of the year. But I could be wrong. Okay. And they've got, they can cut rates because... That's the consensus. First cut by December of yeah. uh, this year. That's a, that's I think I mean. the RBI would be coming under criticism if they haven't cut rates by the end of the year because if you look at the, the level of inflation, particularly core inflation, is, is below the level of rates. So you have positive real rates. Mm. But obviously with a stock market at all-time highs, mm. huge domestic flows getting to the stock market, the RBI doesn't feel under massive pressure to cut rates today. Yeah, no, absolutely. Mm. Uh, Chris, uh, what about flows into India? Because the market here has been marching to the uh, sort of uh, drumbeat of local investors put, putting in money, and that number has sharply increased. It's about $4 billion regularly a month coming into mutual funds. Mm. It was about $2 billion a month before elections. So mm. actually, post-elections, the number has gone from 2 to $4 billion mm. a month. Uh, I remember you were surprised when the market here, I mean, barely shrugged. Uh, in no, that, response to the election, that was a big surprise. To, um, that was a big surprise to me. And of course, after the capital gains, uh, well, that's the, actually the biggest surprise to me is the second. Yeah. So after the election, clearly there's only one day sell-off. But then I think the market's reaction was explained by the fact when I came to Delhi shortly, it was clear that everybody believed this government could last five yeah, years yeah. With, the, with, with, with the two minority parties. So that became more explicable to me. But I have to say, I'm, I'm genuinely astonished by the resilience to the capital gains increase, which mm. is quite material, most particularly as the week before I met many domestic institutional investors and, and they were not expecting the rate, capital rate gains, gains tax increase. Mm. So I find that... Actually, and many of them were very vocal that markets will be hurt. Yes, I would have been too. So we've all been completely wrong. <laughs> so what it, the only explanation is that the domestic households who are investing through these monthly instalment plans have, come, have become convinced, in my view correctly, that India is a, a good long-term equity story mm. and don't want to be scared out of the market. Mm. That's the only... And the, the, the big story of India this year is these domestic flows. Yeah. Uh, but what about foreign flows? You said that uh, fe easing cycle is great for EMs. India mm. is an emerging market. Foreigners see, have stayed away. I mean, you see, uh, but on a relative basis, if you're investing, if you're an EM fund manager, 
after this 50 basis point rate cu cut yesterday, mm. the markets you're going to want to add positions to are places like Brazil, mm. which have 11% nominal rates, 5-6% mm. real rates, mm. so huge potential to cut rates. <clears throat> markets in Southeast Asia, like Indonesia, Philippines, which are traditionally very sensitive to lower U.S. rates, weaker U.S. dollar. Hmm. So India is not the obvious place to put your money in today because when it's expensive, and two, the RBI is in no hurry to slash rates. Hmm. But haven't uh, well, I mean you've been at the conference? You've been speaking mm. with a lot of foreign investors who are here. Mm. Uh, what's the sense you get I mean, about India? Yeah, it's expensive, but. It's been expensive. You could have made the same argument three months, six months, a year well, no, ago. The people who are, you know, the people who, obviously, the, the people here are already invested. Right. And so their, their issue, they're not too hung up on the valuation. I mean, they're all concerned about the valuation. No, we're talking about incremental flows into mm. the Indian market. I mean, what's the sense you get on that? I mean, is... Well, my sense is, yes, the, 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 problem, for the, the problem for the foreign fund managers as a whole mm. is that they are underweight. Based on our latest data, based on the top 30 uh, global emerging market equity funds, they're now marginally underweight, mm. which is not where they want to be, because mm. most of them would agree with me that this is the best long-term story. Mm. But they're underweight. They're, they become underweight from a de facto standpoint. One, because they've been reluctant to pour money in because of the high valuations. Mm. Two, because the, this is a very important point: the neutral benchmark weighting of India has just gone up a lot, which has forced has made them become underweight by market performance. But there's an additional issue: there are two sectors where they're. The two sectors where foreigners have as literally most invested in India have ironically been underperforming, i.e. Um, IT services and, and banks. banks. Mm. So, yeah. so in the last year, many foreign investors, particularly value oriented investors, would have gone into the banks for the first time because they came within the valuation range. Mm. But, uh, you know, then they're not, they're not the hot areas of the market. The hot areas of the market in India have been areas like... Uh, Industrials, yeah, industrials and industrials, infrastructure, real estate, and, real estate energy, yeah, yeah. defense. These are the areas which have been driving the market. That's mm. not the area traditional emerging market investors have been uh, investing in. Mm. So you don't think that foreign investors is, are going to come back to India in a big way? Well, not, in, not in the immediate term, but the good news about this is the really positive point to take away is any major correction in India, like say 10%, in mm. my view, <laughs> will be viewed by foreigners as the opportunity they've been waiting for to add. Are you still expecting a 10% 10, 10 correction? No, I'm not. I'm, I'm just that, saying that's... I mean, that. someone, someone said 5 is the new 10 and maybe 2 mm. is the new 5. I, no, my view, I'm, look, I, I, my, I've got a greed and fair long in the India portfolio. I'm not, you know, I'm not going that defensive in it. Okay. So, because the point is, I can afford a correction. I've got very good performance, <laughs> but my so my portfolio is heavily in energy, real estate, <coughs> capex plays. Mm -hmm. But I have got the bank, so that's I suppose the conservative part of my portfolio. Okay, okay. But the real issue for foreigners. I think the more, the more foreigners know about India, the more specialized they are in the market, the more relaxed they are on the valuations. Mm. It's just the, uh, it's the, the generalists are the more concerned. Mm. And global investors, as opposed to global emerging market investors, barely own Indian equities at all. Mm. So the I'm point, talking about global funds. Right. Yeah. Not EM funds, but yeah, global, global funds. They barely own India at all. At all. Yeah, literally. They don't own India. So it's a strange kind of a position, right? I mean, because you're saying it's a long, is the best long-term yeah, so story. Many, many global investors will agree that India is now the best story. Mm. But there's a practical issue that to, if, you, if you only invest in India via ADRs, mm. you have extremely limited choices. Mm. Uh, because of the lack of ADRs quoted offshore, mm. unlike in China, there are many ADRs. Mm. And uh, the second practical issue, if you want to invest in India in a sort of more real manner, you have to get FII approval, mm. and that, that is a regulatory, that's a regulatory obstacle, right? That, that, that requires a real commitment. Mm. So many, most global funds have not got FII Is status. that such a big issue? I mean, yes, uh, that's, that's an issue. Don't underestimate that. Yeah. So a big fund management company could have their global emerging market fund mm. with FII status, but their global fund may not have it. Mm. And then another, this, this capex increase, or the capital gains tax, will mm. now become another, mm. will now put them off. 
You know, in your, in your note, uh, I think the, uh, the last but one note, you did mention that you put in the capital gains and you said, well, that worries you. Now that, bit... now that personally, I don't believe in capital gains taxes on equities because mm. people have already earned the money mm. and they're risking, they're risking, they, they should be encouraged to invest in equities. Mm. Now, obviously, you can deduct the money you lose. Mm. But that's just a philosophical point. So obviously the government's raising... No, but did you mean that in the context of where India is in, the, in terms of the political... Well, no, no, that, that, that is an issue because in most Asian markets, mm. you, do not, you do not pay capital gains tax. Mm. But be, they, be you domestic or foreigners. Mm. But there's another technical issue in, in, where, where if you're running a dedicated Indian fund, or you have to make a, a provision for that capital gains tax, apparently, even if you haven't, even if you haven't sold the stock. Mm. You okay. see what I mean? So if you're a fund manager, you're kind of starting behind the benchmark. Hmm. Because of this? Yes. Okay. So that is actually a negative, yeah. Hmm. That's a negative for people trying to uh, do dedicated Indian funds, mm -hmm. offshore. Mm -hmm. so, so do you think this, uh, I mean, India's weight has gone up, right, mm. in, the, in the benchmarks. Uh, but you think, you think foreign funds will stay underweight for some time? I mean, that underweight position can and actually even widen if local uh, investors continue to put in money and the market yeah, continues that, to that, do that's well. The direction of travel is foreign ownership is declining relative to domestic ownership. Hmm. Fundamentally, these domestic flows are just extremely positive. Hmm. And we estimate Indian households have 6% of their assets in equities. Hmm. Though none of us are expecting the recent pace of flows to, you know, by every law of logic, they should slow down. Mm. As you say, it's remarkable they've picked up since the election. Mm. I mean, it's $4, $4 billion mm. a month now uh, but, on, on a regular basis. But from a macro standpoint, you know, last, at this conference last year, we were arguing that we were in the early days of a CAPEX cycle, but you couldn't really show data comprehensively proving that. Mm. Actually, the best evidence we were in the early days of a CAPEX cycle a year ago, 15 months ago, was the CapEx stocks were rallying. Mm. Sure. But there wasn't the actual data. But now there's real data mm. highlighting that the CapEx, private sector CapEx cycles underway. Mm. But, uh, but, but do you think uh, in a lot of ways, across sectors, I mean, stocks are already pricing a lot of this sure. in, in India. I mean, CapEx stocks, for example. Mm. So tactically, you would be a bit more cautious. You, you would be. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so but so I'm not, I've got these long only portfolios and I believe this. See, the last time India had a CapEx cycle, which I would say was like from 2002 to 2009, mm. India massively outperformed the rest of Asia in that period. I remember it clearly. So mm. I, I, if this CapEx cycle is happening, structurally, I want to remain invested in the stories. Mm. Even if they go through periods of underperformance, but yeah. eventually it'll... Uh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's a great story. Plus, we have the, obviously, we have the, real, the residential property story, which... Precedes. Which you've been very bullish on. Yeah, and we don't think there's, we, you know... You me, did highlight that last quarter there was a bit of a slowdown, but... Right, uh, but that, I would view all that as a pause to refresh. You know. Okay. So, we've got good news of, if there's, if there's a weakness to the residential property story, which has been dramatic here, right, and, mm. uh, if there's a weakness, it's, all, it's, it's very much focused on what they, what they call the high end. Mm which I suppose in the U.S., well, it depends what city you're in. The but premium end has done very well. Yeah. You're saying that perhaps sees some... Well, what I'm saying, if you're, if you're going to criticize it, you will say it's very vulnerable because okay. it's just the high end going up. Okay. But I would say, in response, well, I would have to admit that's true. Mm. I would say that's normally how property cycles work. They start with the high end and they gradually trickle down. Mm. And in that sense, rate cuts would help mm. because I suppose... I, you know, if you go under 200 to use dollars, not if you go under 2,000 dollars mm. for a unit, you're probably going to get to levels of more rate sensitive buyers. Mm. And so, if rates go down 200 basis points here or 150 basis points, that's going to increase the number of people who can who, who can, can afford can afford it. Right. So, uh, so for uh, uh, I'm, I'm heard that the invent, I think I heard this week that inventory in the top seven cities is at a 14 year low. Yeah. 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 So. It's, if that's true, yeah. I mean, uh, we can definitely keep going for another four years. Uh, in terms of the cycle, in terms of real estate build-up? Yes, because uh, we've just entered our fourth year of an upturn. Okay. So you're so saying another, what, another four years? Another yeah. four years. Mm. Uh, Obviously, we take it a year as it comes, but from a, given the fact that we had a seven-year downturn, right. given this multi-year inventory low, given the fact that India builds far fewer residential units, yeah. 
today that even China, yeah. given its current problems, builds. Yeah. You know, there's uh, there's no reason to think why this suddenly blows up. So, uh, uh, give, tell us the sectors or places that you're most bullish on now, Chris. If somebody is trying to put fresh money to work here, what what would you? I would know, like say? put it in today. So I'm not taking. Uh, I've got 19% in real estate stocks in okay. my um, India portfolio. Okay. Now, if what, I, else, what else have you? If had, I was starting the portfolio today, I might be a bit nervous putting 19%. But given the fact that I have 90% that have done well already, okay. I'm not going to actually reduce them. Okay. But if I want to have a more cash, let's say I, I can't own cash, hmm. but I wanted to be more tactically cautious hmm. because I've got I've got more short-term tactical considerations, and I. The, the, you want to own the stocks which are more neo cash proxies, which, mm. are, which I would say are like the banks mm. or the consumer staples. Mm. So, I mean, they're, they're perhaps there's a little bit of underperformance. I'm not sure. Banks have valuation comfort, consumer staples, maybe not so much. No, so, no but they're still, because we've got, we've, got, we've got, I think we have evidence now that the rural economy is finally picking up, right? Mm. So, I can see a case for adding to those tactically. Tactically. Mm. But if you were looking at slightly beyond the uh, very near term, looking beyond the near term, I'm, I'm sticking with my current portfolio. Okay. So the issue of so my, which is 19% real estate. What else? No, it's big what? in capex plays and energy. Okay. And Ca if any real correction in those areas, I'd be looking to add. Okay. Because okay. I'm quite heavy in the banks, but we are the, the the whole infrastructure story here in India the energy story these these seem to be at the center of the action at the center mm. of the capex cycle sure it's just very positive for an economy if you have both a re residential property upturn and a private sector capex cycle going on so the way i look at it conceptually is that the government in the last 10 years has spent a huge amount at the, at the central government level building capex mm which has been the big driver of the fiscal deficit as opposed to tr transfer payments. Sure. So that has basically, that's been the enabling factor for the economy, which good should give the private sector confidence to invest. Mm. And we are now in the last year seeing that actually happen happening. Absolutely. Yes. So whereas a year ago, uh, talking to people in the government, they were saying, why, they were, like, you know, they were saying, why, aren't the pri why isn't the private <laughs> sector investing? So I was saying, well, don't worry, the private sector capital stocks are going up. Yeah. But obviously, if you're a government official, the stocks going up is not, is, you, know, you, you don't yeah. trust yeah. the evidence. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. <laughs> Chris, uh, just one last point. You were tactically, you were cautious, right? You know, tell me you're a bit cautious. Yeah. We've got election, another round of elections, state elections mm. uh, coming up. Are they going to be important? Have you heard that as feedback from investors? They're well, watching no, it closely. What, no, what are on the uh, on the uh, yes on the big state? Like, what's it? Obviously, we're seeing cat. We're seeing handouts, right? Right, across states. I mean, yes. Uh, so that's obviously. I mean, that's another reason to maybe add to consumer staples. Tactically, long term, that's not so great, but mm. that just means maybe the incumbent has a chance of winning where everybody thought they were going to lose. Mm. But would it uh, make a difference? I mean. Even if the ruling party were uh, not... No, so that would create some negative noise. Because, I mean, some argue that the general elections barely caused a bump. So why should this matter? Well, I kind of agree with that. You do? My message, the, 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 what I picked up talking to government-related people this week is rather than passing lots of laws, mm. the bigger focus seems to be on doing away a lot of these regu regulations, mm. which are a legacy of the... Uh, what they call the license raj. Hmm. I think there would, there, there's a, clearly a case for a bonfire of regulations to promote, uh, to promote business. That sounds like Elon Musk in America. Yes. <laughs> What's to say? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. Absolutely. Uh, Chris, it's wonderful to speak with you. Thank you for sitting down with us. Appreciate your time here on CNBC TV 18. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.